Hi there, welcome. I'm Ariella, and this is a lecture on the relationship between bees and flowers called Messengers of Love. And this is the first lecture, a free lecture in a seven part series. I did the same series last year for 2022 Kindred Bees. So you can always check those out. Um, but this will be the first of the next seven lectures. And like I said, this first one is free. I'm gonna make a quick audio settings change because of course we have a leaf blower going off right outside my window. Okay, hopefully that'll be better. Okay. While we're all gathering, for those of you here live, just curious if you can find in the chat one or two, you know, where are you from? And one or two words as to why this lecture? Is it the bees? Are you an herbalist? Are you in gardening? What is it? I just love to find out. So if you feel um, inspired, just a little note in the chat. It's always a great way to get to know what's happening for folks. And you're welcome to have your screen on or off either way. Um, I am going to start us off as you're sharing. Let's we'll see, Northern Minnesota, oh, New Mexico. Longtime herbalist and gardener. Great, brand new beekeeper, congratulations. Beekeeping from Amsterdam. I went to a wonderful conference just outside of Amsterdam called Learning from the Bees in 2018. Um, really great community of folk gather there. Savannah, Georgia, probably some great bee country down there. <laughs> Illinois, yeah, love of nature, of course. Hi, Ren, good to see you from Sweden. Bees, Los Angeles, oh, you're moving fast now. Fair Oaks, yep, that's near where I am. Northern California. Oh, oh, thank you, Lori. Good to have you here. 12 year beekeeper and spiritual practitioner. Yeah. New Jersey herb and plant grower. Nova Scotia. Wonderful. Love seeing all this. Pennsylvania, Greece. Wanting to learn about flowers, herbalism. Fantastic. Love seeing this. Love, 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 bees, gardens, and this divine relationship. Let's begin with some poetry. Why not? Because after all, this is a topic that touches on the poetic soul. When we talk about bees and flowers, we find them again and again and again and again in metaphor and poetry. We see it in ancient poetry, we see it in modern poetry. It's a very kind of long time relationship. And that's because there is something about the divine nature of the bees that drink nectar from the flowers that evokes a poetic flow. As we used to say, or is still said today, a poet is someone who is honey tongued blessed with the nectar of the bees. So we will begin, as long as I actually kept it saved, good, 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 with some excerpts from Khalil Gibran. He was from the 1800s. I'm sure you've heard his beautiful work. Maybe not. The Prophet is a, good, is a really good place to start. And this is his excerpt on pleasure. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it's always, always fun to start with some of the poetic inspiration. You are welcome to listen with your eyes open or closed. Then a hermit who visited the city once a year came forth and said, speak to us of pleasure. And he answered saying, pleasure is a freedom song, but it is not freedom. It is the blossoming of your desires, but it is not their fruit. It is a depth calling unto a height, but it is not the deep nor the high. It is the caged talk, a taking wing, but it is not space encompassed. 
I, in very truth, pleasure is a freedom song. And I fain would have you sing it with the fullness of your heart, yet I would not have you lose your hearts in the singing. And then we're gonna move on to a little bit further down in the writing. And now you ask in your hearts, how shall we distinguish that which is good in pleasure from that which is not good? Go to your fields and your gardens and you shall learn that it is the pleasure of the bee to gather honey of the flower, but it is also the pleasure of the flower to yield its honey to the bee. For to the bee, a flower is a fountain of life. And to the flower, a bee is a messenger of love. And to both bee and flower, the giving and receiving, the, the giving and the receiving of pleasure is a need and an ecstasy. People of Orphalese, be in your pleasures, like the flowers and the bees. Be in your pleasures, like the flowers and the bees. What did people think long ago about bees and flowers before we started observing with our scientific methods? What were people observing and how was it spoken about? Because of course we know that the ancients had very acute and very astute observational skills. Maybe they didn't have the scientific method as it's determined today, but they were observing. And one of the ways that these observations were translated were into the mythos and the belief system of the time. And so one of my favorite examples of, a couple of favorite examples of where honey comes from is this idea that Every night in ancient Greece, every night, there would be a divine mist that would flow down from the heavens, from the land of the gods, and it would alight on the petals of flowers. It would sink into the heart of each flower. And in the morning, the bees would come and drink up this gathered essence, this dew, this sacred ambrosia from the gods, they would gather it up from the flowers and drink it in and then take it back to these hidden dark crevices, these hollows in the earth and the trees and in the caves where it would transform from a watery dew-like substance we now call nectar, it's called nectar then as well, into honey, which was considered a divine food is an incredibly healing food and substance and is quite literally the food for the bees. Honey is bee food, which means nectar is also bee food. I'm going to give this lecture with the sense that you don't know a lot about bees, although I know some of you are beekeepers because I really want it to feel invitational to everyone who comes. So let's start with that. Nectar and honey are what bees eat. So nectar is sort of the, it's coming from the flower. It's produced by the flower. We'll get to why and all of that in a second, but it's coming from the flower and it's being, it's drawing the bees in and they're drinking it up. Kind of watery, very sugary, uh, lots of glucose, fructose, or both, uh, or well, it's always both, but it's usually a combination one more than the other. And that affects the vicos viscosity of the nectar. So that's an immediate energy boost. In fact, if bees are out there flying around, pollinating, gathering nectar from different flowers and they get tired, they can, letting some more people in, they can take that nectar that's stored in a very special secondary stomach called their, their honey crop that just holds and stores within their body, this nectar. They can take it and bring it back up into their digestive tract, the other stomach and give themselves a little bit of energy and metabolize it. So then what is honey if they're getting energy from nectar? Honey is long-term storage. 
<laughs> honey is the stable food that can last thousands of years that the bees make. It is not just nectar. Honey is what the bees make when they combine nectar with their own enzymes within their body that alchemizes and transforms the honey into something else. It's then the nectar that's been transformed is then placed into the hive, into the hexagonal cells known as comb or honeycomb. And other bees in the hive, younger bees, we call them house bees. So the older bees are out foraging and the younger bees are staying at the, at the house, staying inside the hive. And these bees fan their wings, creating evaporation within the hive, evaporating all that water until that honey becomes ripe. It's usually around 18 to 20% um, of the water content. So they fan off all of this water and leave this ripe food. And this ripe food is now uh, technically self-stable uh, self or preserved. And the bees can seal it off with a thin little bit of wax and keep it for the winter. And why is all of this important? Because when you look at bees and flowers, you're looking at a window in time that is absolutely essential for the preservation and um, thriving of life. The bees need the nectar from the flowers that open during these spring, summer, and even early fall months of the year, especially when in, in climates with four seasons. Of course, there's other climates all over with different rules. But if we're looking at, for instance, Apis mellifera, the, the Western honeybee, you're looking at a animal that needs to, an organism that needs to survive the cold months or also survive drought, survive long periods of rain. So these bees are absolutely dependent on the nectar coming from flowers during a certain window of time, window in, um, in the spring and summer mostly, to gather enough food to last them through unpredictable times such as drought and the winter. Flowers, in turn, want desire to proliferate. They want to spread who and what they are across the landscape. And not just for flowers, but also, as Jacqueline Freeman, who wrote the Song of Increase, talks about, for the migration of minerals, which happens very slowly over time. And when the minerals are able to move with the plant life across the landscape, the plant life regenerates the soil. And so there's a, a, an essential life-giving property to the relationship of the bees pollinating flowers and the flowers being able to expand their habitat to thrive, to reproduce themselves and move across the landscape and also in turn regen regenerate the soil. And then of course we know that flowers produce fruit, which the animals of this earth eat. So we have a, a very important relationship going on here between bees and flowers. Pollination is what happens when bees visit flowers. So all sorts of insects visit flowers. Pollination happens a few different ways. One of the ways, for instance, is wind migration, but that's fairly unpredictable. When the wind blows, sure, off go the bits of pollen. What is pollen? Pollen is what the male organ of the flower produces. And so the pollen is something that wants to, wants to go into the world. As those of us with allergies know well, the pollen wants to fly into the world to pollinate other flowers as an act of reproduction, right? And wind is great, it gets us so far, but really, Flowers have learned to adapt to very specific pollinators over time to attract specific or a range of pollinators, depending on the kind of flower, so that it's, um, how do we put it, like a more reliable form of reproduction instead of being cast to the ethers in every direction, which is a great way to reproduce for the flowers. There's, there's also 
this more efficient way of reproducing by attracting pollinators. And honeybees in particular are really interesting because they are quite loyal. They will only pollinate one flower, one species at a time, trip after trip, back and forth from the hive, pollinating that area, which means gathering nectar and pollen from that spot for a period of time until the nectar is complete for that period of the day. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. And in the process of gathering nectar to transform it into honey as food, and in the process of gathering pollen, which they also transform through a fermentation process into something called bee bread, which they feed young bees, very high in protein. In this process, they are gathering pollen onto their bodies and visiting other flowers. And so there's this really direct relationship between the bee gathering pollen from, well, let's say a sunflower and then moving to another sunflower. Immediately that flower is pollinated. It's a little bit more insurance than wind pollination. So flowers have adapted over time to really ensure that this happens which is where we get to look at this ancient old relationship between bees and flowers, which predates us by a lot. We're the little blip at the end of the time spectrum. And way, way back, bees and flowers kind of adapted at the same time. And that's because as flowers were developing, they were also um, attracting, through many ways, other pollinators like flies, and wasps. And it's believed that these you know, flies and wasps were some of the first insects out there. And that what happened was through hunting, and you can read about this in Thor Hansen's book, The Buzz, just buzz. <laughs> um, through hunting flies, for instance, there were wasps that were basically meat eaters, you know, they'd hunt flies and they, and in the process, the, they would accumulate because flies were on flowers, they would accumulate pollen. And then they would bring that back to the nest. The young baby wasps would eat some of that pollen and, it, and they discovered that there was a preference for that. And over time, there was a divergence in the species and some of these wasps became vegetarians because it was far safer to just collect pollen than to go hunting. And these vegetarian wasps eventually became bees who would, of course, go back to collect pollen and nectar. So that's just a little bit of like, where does, where does this relationship come from? What are bees and flowers? Why, why is it a thing? What is pollination? All of that. But before getting into some of the mechanisms and why and what's happening and how do bees pollinate, what do flowers do to attract them? I wanna bring us back to these, these ideas of where it came from in the beginning. And I'm only going to use a couple of examples. The example of the mist or the dew in the sky. I love that one. Um, both of these examples are from Greek culture. There's a lot of beekeeping in ancient Greece, Minoan Crete, Egypt, um, and the ancient world in this way. So these were some of the places where we have historical records of beekeeping also Anatolia, which is now Turkey. These are places where we have very old records of beekeeping. Bees of course were everywhere. They migrated out of Africa up into Central Europe and across from there. Um, and of course there's like the bees, and we're talking, if we're talking about honeybees there's also other species in Asia. But in terms of Apis mellifera, which is my specialty, Bees were kept and very highly observed in the Greek world. And there was a big, strong connection to bees and the divine, specifically the divine feminine. So one of the other stories that I love is that bees harvested similar to as, a, as, as I believe it was Plato who said, similar to the maidens who harvested herbs in the fields, the women who gathered herbs. Bees also gathered from the flowers and they gathered poisons out of the flowers, but 
theirs was of such a divine nature that they could transform poison into honey so it could be ingested. I think that's a really interesting way to approach what the flowers were, that these flowers contained the poisons. And that was probably because there was some observance that bees could in fact drink the nectar from actual poisonous plants and transform it into honey. So there's another interesting one about the alchemy of what happens within the bees, around the bees. The first wine also came from bees. We know it as mead. And this mead, this wine was often equated to the, um, the nectar or the wine drunk by the poet to bring on divine inspiration. So again, we have this long-standing connection. I'm still talking about ancient Greece between the bee and honey and the poet. And in one of Plato's writings about plays and dramas of the time, he talks about how there was a special drink that was given to the audience based on mead. And this drink helped bring people into the heightened state to receive the poetic inspirations that were then to be presented to themselves. And I love this quote, I wanna share this with you from Plato about the connection between, you could say nectar or poetry and these dramas or plays that were poetic in nature and how they were, how they were received, so. The drama itself is a drink that the poets have fetched from the magical springs that flow in the gardens of the muses. A potion composed of the co-mingling nectars of flowers that are tended not by human agents, but simply found in a metaphysical wilderness by the ecstatic poets. As they go, like bees from each to each. A potion composed of the co-mingled nectars of flowers that are tended not by human agents, but simply found in a metaphysical wilderness by the ecstatic poets as they go like bees from each to each. It is this special drink that the poets offer and through it, the whole world seems metamorphosed with rivers that flow with milk and honey. With rivers that flow with milk and honey. What a great reason to get into poetry. Okay, I'm not gonna teach about poetry today. I am gonna get into who the bees are and who the flowers are and how they relate, but I thought it would be such a great way to start with these metaphors and this inspiration that we're always seeing. And that's because when you look at a bee with a flower, you witness something ecstatic. And I, I invite you, if you haven't witnessed it, to really pay attention to the flowers this spring, specifically large buds like poppies and roses that has, have a lot of little follicles of pollen covered or salmon, salmon's covered with pollen. Flowers that have many folds and layers and watch the bees. Because what will happen is mostly you're gonna see bees going from flower to fat flower gathering. Maybe they're getting that pollen on their bodies. Maybe they're drinking with their little proboscis tongues and they're, they're drinking up that nectar. But also sometimes you will see a bee that is unmistakably ecstatic. I'm just gonna like glance at some of you here or here live. You're probably like nodding while you're taking notes. Like, yeah, I've seen that. This unmistakable ecstatic experience where the bee is nuzzling into the flower, rolling in the flower, buzzing in the flower, just it, it's as if she, cause it's always a she if they're in a flower, she is, at least for honeybees, um, bathing in the flower. And in a way she is, what she is doing is this love making dance with the flower that is an absolute devotional act 
based out of both desire, pleasure, and need. If we go back to the poem from the beginning. And this devotional act is in service to something greater. It's in service to supernatural pollination, of course, because in this process, she is going to pollinate the flowers around her, but she's also going to take that beautiful dance of ec ecstasy back to her hive to tell them about what she's found, tasted, smelled, felt. And so already, even if you don't know anything about bees, watching the flowers in the spring and summer, watching how the bees relate to them is evocative. It's poetic. It brings forth this feeling, forth this feeling of ecstasy, of just seeing this absolute giving over of oneself to the flower. And goodness, wouldn't we all like to be able to do that from time to time? No wonder the poets are so inspired. Add to that honey, a divine taste, which is powerful and healing, and then mead, an absolutely altering beverage. And you can see why the relationship between bees and flowers was perceived as quite divine and a love affair. I love it. As I was preparing for this lecture, I was... Um, Reviewing, reviewing some of my more scientific books and this sort of assertion that I came across a couple of times. It was like, there's nothing romantic about bees and flowers. The, 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 bee, the flowers are deceiving the bees. Flowers are deceiving the bees. They're attracting them through all of these different means to get the bee to come drink the nectar, which is the sweet inducement, right? Bring that nectar in, bring that bee in through the nectar because they want to drink the nectar and inadvertently get them to pollinate the flower. So there's nothing romantic. There's no love here. It's not that. But what I love about these scientific, like, proclamations is that even in those, there is a, um, an, an attachment of an emotion or an act, which is deception, right? So the, fl the flowers are deceiving, which, what, how is that any different than the flowers are blossoming with love for the bees? You know, we're, we're still projecting our human experience onto the bees and the flowers. And yet, I feel that if for thousands of years humans have associated flowers and bees with acts of the divine and acts of love, there might be something to it. Plus, listen to the bees for long enough and they'll tell you it's true. But let's get into it. Let's talk more about the bees and how they get their nectar, why they go to the flowers, all of that biological stuff that's actually quite magical. So first and foremost, what do the bees need? The bees need nourishment. They need not just food, but actual nourishment. So food, and from a beekeeper's perspective, for instance, could be some form of sugar syrup. In fact, often is. Many, many beekeepers feed their bees sugar water, taking the honey and using that for human, need, human gain and profit and giving the bees back sugar water because sure, that's energy, that's food, but it's not nourishment. In commercial beekeeping, Beekeepers also bring bees to large open swaths of orchards, crops to get food and to pollinate for the farm, for the farming industry and for big ag, big agriculture. But that would be like only eating apples or only eating broccoli for three or four weeks. Imagine how you would feel. Not so great. Maybe you'd have energy, but you wouldn't be nourished. So what is nourishment? Nourishment is something that comes from 
consuming a diverse diet, being well nourished, and not just from flowers, but from healthy flowers, from flowers that have a strong relationship to the soil and the minerals, from flowers that are in strong soil. So the bees are looking for diverse food sources in and as a form of nourishment. And then from the flowers, they get two kinds of nourishment. They get honey, nectar, excuse me, and pollen. And nectar is used to give the bees energy, to help them literally build the comb inside their home, to um, give them the energy to fly out into the field, et cetera. And then pollen is a protein source that is fed to the very young bees as they're first hatching and helps produce their digestive tract, helps keep them, um, it helps with their immunity because they have a strong digestive tract, which is you know, something true for humans as well. Our, our gut is part of our immune system in a way, it really informs our immune system. And so if the bees, for instance, are born and only fed one or two kinds of pollen, and not fed this diverse nourishing diet from all these different flowers, again, their overall health is going to be diminished from the get-go. So flowers of many sorts are needed to bring forward nourishment. So this is what the bees need. What the flowers need is to be pollinated because they can't do it themselves. They need help in their sexual reproduction. And so they bring in the bees and other pollinators to help them spread and reproduce. And in doing so, they're attending to the land and to the fauna, which include humans. So bees and flowers have, and pollinators as a whole have adapted over time in relationship to one another. For instance, there are certain night blooming flowers that only attract moths that have very long uh, proboscises that can go into deep into the flower. And that night blooming flower is probably not gonna be attracting honeybees. And there are certain types of like vanilla, I believe is only pollinated by ants. So there are some pollinator, some flowers that are only pollinated by one species. Um, one very dedicated species and have adapted, there are certain orchids that are this way as well, have adapted to living um, in relationship to this one species. But a lot of flowers have adapted to be able to draw in multiple types of pollinators and especially bees as a whole, not just honeybees, but bees, because there's of course many other kinds of bees beyond honeybees, because bees are the most efficient pollinators. And um, honeybees in particular, as I already said, are, are very loyal to one plant at a time. So they can really support the growth of that one plant and then they'll move on to another. So flowers are needing to attract these bees and adapt to do so. And so they have learned to do this through color, through scent, olfaction, the beautiful scent of flowers through movement in relationship to the wind, so therefore how they grow and flower and open, through when they produce their nectar in time with other flowers in the region. So they don't have nectar 100% of the time all day long, they have nectar windows. Through electromagnetics or electricity that has more recently been discovered and discerned in relationship to the bees and, and more. There's other, other things, but those are the main ones. Colors, scent, movement, nectar windows, electromagnetics, patterns as well. Talk about patterns soon. And then the bees are needing to also not just be drawn to these flowers, but know how to find them. They need to find them. They need to learn where they are within the landscape, meaning they have to memorize where they are in the landscape. They have to try to figure it out multiple times. So these little bee brains are doing quite a lot. The first they've got to learn how to identify flowers. Then they've got to learn how to identify 
the region that the flower is in, learn how to find it again, learn how to identify other flowers that are the same as that one that they just found, and then how to communicate what that flower is and where it is to their hive. It's pretty incredible what they do. They also have to distinguish between different kinds of flowers and they have to distinguish the, the general well-being of the flower, as in, is it full of nectar? Has the nectar dried out? Um, they also have to learn how to work the flower, how to get into, where to get to the nectar. Some flowers are tubular, some flowers are you know, open, some flowers have tiny little buds. We're learning how to get into the interior nectar source, which is designed by the flowers to draw the bees in. So if, for instance, not if, but the nectar is always going to be in a place that ensures that as the bee gets to it, the bee or the other pollinator is being dusted with pollen, which is, uh, which has a, um, like a static electricity to it. So it, it does get attracted to the bee through the hairs all over the bee's body. Bees also have to learn when the flowers have their peak nectar flow. So there's a lot to learn and they do that through their incredible biology, how they're designed. It's not just their brains. Um, so let's talk about that. And then in doing so, we'll learn more about the flowers as well. So they're going to be engaging all of their sense organs. We will begin by talking about, let's see, let's see. There's so many things I wanna talk about. <laughs> Let's talk about their vision. Mm. And before I do so, I'm gonna show you to quickly check this chat. Oh, great. People telling me where you're from. Hmm, wonderful. Okay, cool. These have Compound eyes. Compound eyes are these two big eyes on their face made up of thousands of lenses. I've seen 6,000, I've seen 7,000 different resources. So we got a lot of eyes, got a lot of lenses, excuse me, not eyes. And interestingly enough with the honeybee, these lenses are all hexagonal. So they, C in hexagons. And what they do is they, with these compound eyes, they can detect shapes, patterns, and colors and gather them up all as individual tiny images to make a composite image. They also have three little eyes. They're sometimes called simple eyes or celli, ocelli, I never know how to pronounce it. I've never checked um, on top of their head. And these eyes read light. Specifically, they can see polarized light, meaning that even on a cloudy day, they can see through the clouds and see the sun. And that's really important because they use the sun to navigate when they're out in the field. Bees also see things in slow motion. So they see things at one three hundredth of a second. In comparison, we as humans see things at 1 50th of a second. So they see rapid movements um, that appear blurred to us. They can perceive them clearly. That helps maybe makes it, makes it more, makes more sense than just a number. So something that's blurred to us or almost imperceptible to us seems like, for instance, a flower, a small tiny flower in a little field Maybe it's even your yard appears to be still. It appears to be not moving. But to a bee, they can see the movement of the flower on the stalk and their eyes are designed, their vision is designed to be able to recognize that movement that the flower is making that we can't see. This also means that bees are a little bit more sensitive to things like swatting because what's blurry to us, so my hand is probably blurry as you do that, they're seeing that very clearly. It gives them a target to follow because that can signify danger to them. So that's why we don't swat at bees. That's also why sometimes they're drawn to stinging um, the face, uh, lips, 
nostrils, eye, air, eye region, because these are places that are making more movements so they can see more clearly. Beyond this ability to see in slow motion or see things we can't see in terms of motion, they also can see things we can't see in terms of vision, uh, color, in terms of color. So we see what we think of as the rainbow, the spectrum of light. We see red, which are the long waves, and then all the way down to blue. If you think of a rainbow, you know, well, I guess, yeah, the smaller bits could be blue, but the typical drawn rainbow, you've got this longer red, and then it gets smaller and smaller, and you have the blue at the bottom, depending on how you draw it. But point being, the small end of the spectrum or the short end of the spectrum of light, we can see that, but only to a point. There is more that goes beyond those shore waves. And that more is the ultraviolet light or ultraviolet, um, yeah, no, just ultraviolet light. And this is something that bees can see. So they don't actually specialize in the red zone. They can see reds, but they appear more like blacks, like blobs of black. So for instance, a red poppy would appear mostly black to the bees, big blob of black waving, but there might be patterns of ultraviolet light, these reflective patterns on the leaves themselves that we can't see. So a lot of flowers actually have reflective ultraviolet light on their petals, which does a few things. It makes them stand out in the environment, but it also um, can be used or the flower can design itself to create patterns like um, sometimes like little runways or um, patterns that draw the bees in to the heart of the flower. So it can be strips, it can be even sometimes horizontal lines, it depends on the flower, but there are these different patterns that we can't see that the bee can, which I think is absolutely wonderful. You can always go look for some pictures of ultraviolet photographs of flowers because we do have camera gear that can take those pictures. But um, I, I didn't, I didn't want to, I wanted to be able to talk to you and not focus on slides because there's so much content I wanted to share with you today. So that's pretty cool. Color and their sight uh, or their ability to see color also depends on how fast they're flying. So bees have sort of two modes when it comes to flying. They have the traveling across the landscape flying when they're flying fast. And this is typical of having found a source and knowing that source of food. So now they're flying back to that source. And when they're flying through a landscape quickly, they, are able to turn off their color receptors or just they aren't they they don't focus on the color receptors and things appear more like a like colorblind they see shapes there's that oak tree there's that barn there's that telephone pole when they get close to the flowers and start circling down following the scent to the flowers that's when their color receptors come back on. And as they get really close, things become more vivid and clear. So when they're flying fast, their color receptors aren't on. When they get close up, the color engages. When they leave the hive, a bee has to find a nectar source. And she's going to find it in, in one of two ways. Either she's going to be shown or told for it, or she's going to go out on an initial foraging mission. So these bees that are on their initial foraging missions are going to leave the hive, and typically they're going to, well, the one they're going to hope for a nice, nice day, because we're moving from vision on to olfaction or scent. Before color, before for seeing the flowers, they have to scent the flowers. On a nice breezy day, not too windy, not too stale, the flowers produce trails of scent 
Again, something we cannot see, but the bee can pick it up like rhythm, uh, ri ribbons of scent moving through the landscape as she flies in greater and greater circles out into the landscape. And she can find one of these trails and follow it, meandering towards the source of the scent. And as she gets closer to it and it gets stronger and stronger, she again starts angling down, or not angling, uh, circling down, landing usually against the wind to on the flowers. And this is the bee that starts to do the ecstatic rolling around in the flower to get to know everything about it so that she can bring this back to tell her sisters. So scent, how do bees smell? Bees smell through their antenna. Most insects have antenna that sticks straight up. Bees have antenna that bend at 90 degrees so they can actually, and, and they turn all the way around so they can read things all around them, including each other. It's how they, one of the biggest ways they communicate in the hive because they're living in the dark, so they're feeling. So the antenna are responsible for touch. One of their biggest experiences of touch, they're very sensitive, the antenna of bees. They can read temperature, they can read humidity. They can, of course, smell. They, this is where their olfaction takes place. They can, let's see what else. Um, oh yeah, read pheromones, such as the well-being of the queen, the mother bee. And then when it comes to scent itself, they have over 60,000 olfactory receptors in their antenna. So scent lures these bees to the flowers over long distances, another invisible thing. Wind helps, yeah. When the bee has found her nectar or flower, she's, she's gonna spend some time in that region. And part of that is that she's got to learn when the window is for the nectar to be at peak performance. And that's going to be part of what draws her in. So the flower is going to release a stronger scent when the flower is at peak nectar. What does that mean? Okay, so these flowers really need to be pollinated. They need to be able to reproduce. And they have a limited supply of nectar because they have to make it, right? They have to make it through converting water, using sunlight and photosynthesis and the, the conversion of sugars in the body and create the body of the flower to create this sweet nectar. And to do that, they, they're they obviously going to need time. They can't just constantly be producing nectar. If all the flowers are producing nectar all at the same time, they would probably dry up around the same time or run out of nectar. And there would be flowers that the bees never got to because they were busy or the pollinators never got to because they were busy with other flowers. So flowers have actually divined a timetable more or less for their peak nectar flows. There will be times, certain times of day when a flower or a patch of flowers is at peak nectar flow and they have the, the most nectar, they've built up their nectar and at that time, perhaps the cherry blossoms are going and the lavender, not so much, although lavender tends to have nectar, quite a, a, a lot of nectar almost all day long, but well, maybe the poppies <laughs> don't have as much nectar and maybe an hour later they do. And bees have to learn this, which is incredible. I think it's amazing that they can do that. They can learn these different peak times for ripeness. What helps with them learning when a flower is ripe is not just scent, but also something pretty magical that we haven't been able to track until more recently, which is that bees, as they fly through the air, generate a positive electrical charge, a little one, but nonetheless, it's a positive electrical charge and or electric field, we should say. And this is in part due to the little hairs all over their bodies, their legs, their abdomens, even their eyes. And the flowers produce a negative charge. And so when a flower is at its peak ripeness or peak nectar flow, this is when it really produces and releases 
this negative charge. It's been studied that particularly with bumblebees, as a bumblebee is approaching a flower, it will release something almost like a pulse of that electric, negative electrical charge and the positive charge of the bee will be magnetized to it. So they are in a magnetic relationship, flowers and bees. This makes me really excited. <laughs> So this little pulse lets the bees know, yep, I'm here, I'm ripe, I'm ready. It's why also you might notice, like, okay, the rosemary is going off in my garden, but the bees just aren't there. It's not that that rosemary isn't delicious. They might have something that they prefer nearby because they are, they do have preferences. There might be something producing more nectar nearby. The rosemary might not be at its peak performance yet. Or the rosemary might be in soil that is not well amended, not really strong, doesn't have strong uh, mineral flow through it. And there's some other garden nearby that has richer soil and the nectar coming from that soil is going to be better, more nourishing. The bees are gonna go for that more. And so there's this relationship that, that, again, all these hidden relationships we don't understand or we don't see, excuse me, that we can, we can understand when we start to see what flowers do and what bees do and their relationship to one another. Furthermore, this electric pulse no longer happens when the bee is, has, oh, those weirdly equilibrium things. When the bee has finished drinking the nectar from the flower, the flower will stop releasing that pulse. So bees flying by will know, oh, I don't need to visit that flower. It's, it's not full at the moment, it's, it, it's empty. Secondly, some bees will also leave, honeybees will also leave a small chemical marker on the petals of the flower, a scent, pheromone scent, informing other bees that the tank is empty for now. And as the flower starts to produce its nectar, again, the scent wears away. And usually by the time the scent wears away, the flower is ready to offer its love again. So there's this constant relationship between the flowers and the bees. Once the bee has really memorized everything there is to know about that first visit, she's gonna go back to the hive. She's gonna take a little nectar with her and she's going to deposit it in the hive. She's gonna give it through her pro proboscis to another sister. What's the proboscis? The proboscis is a straw-like tongue. And this tongue, it has a number of tiny little hairs on it as well that the bee uses to lap up and to suck up the nectar from a flower or honey from within the hive. So there's these little hairs or bristles, about 10,000 bristles covering the tongue of the bee. And they can be angled in different ways to trap nectar. So if you look at a bee, what she's doing when she's drinking nectar is, is she's usually lapping little bits up and then pulling it back through a kind of a pulse or a sucking motion into her body. And that goes into the honey crop, which is where this nectar is stored until it can be given to another sister proboscis to proboscis in the hive, they will eventually from there deposit it into a cell to turn it into honey. Nectars have different viscosity based on the water content and the sugar content in the nectar itself. Some are really thick and syrupy, others are more watery, and bees will adjust according to the different viscosity of the flowers and also the angle that they need to go into to get that nectar. Um, in one trip, especially if they're in the full foraging, not just discovery mode, they can visit around 50 to 200 flowers collecting nectar and pollen until they're totally filled up, until their stomachs are filled, and then they can go back. But we're not there yet. We're still with this one bee who's tasted the nectar with her proboscis, gathered a little, a little bit, brought it back to the hive. And now she's going to make multiple trips. And these trips are designed for one thing. They are designed to determine exactly how to get to this flower, the best route to get to this flower source. Maybe it's a patch of lavender. So how, what's the beeline 
But once she discovers the quickest route, the most direct route to this flower zone, we call that a beeline. And when she has that information, as well as everything else she's memorized about the flower and she's covered in the pollen and she smells like the flower, it's covering her body, the scent is there. Then, after, and this is usually after about 10 trips, then she will communicate what she's found to her sisters. And this is done through a dance. And beekeeping terminology is called the waggle dance. And it's a dance used to communicate not just that she's found food, but exactly where it is in the landscape. And yet she's doing this in the dark within the hive on the comb itself. So comb, which is made from beeswax, is pliable and resonant. And what will happen is the bee will come back and she will sort of plant herself. I used to think that she was kind of doing a run, uh, like walking or running up a central line, but she'll actually plant herself with one of her six legs on hopefully six different walls of these hexagonal cones. And then she will start to vibrate her body up a central line. So usually going from back to front, it looks like she's walking and sometimes she does have to take a couple of steps, but really what she's doing is vibrating her body front, uh, back to front. And depending on how close or how far away or how complex it is to get there, she will either have a small waggle or of longer, more intense waggle. In fact, the intensity of it also communicates how good it is. So the more intense the waggle, the yummier the food is, the better the source. Um, but the, the number of back and forths also tells other things. So it's a very complex language and that's just the beginning. We'll come back to that in just a second. So after she does this, she's going to walk in a circle back to her starting point. If the food source is fairly close by, that's the totality of the dance and then she'll repeat it on the comb. Maybe she'll go to a new spot and repeat it. So it's two to three seconds, the dance. And then a circle and then somewhere else doo -doo -doo -doo, and a circle. If it's a little bit further away, if the directions are more complex, like, okay, you're gonna go down, you're gonna cross the bridge and then you're gonna turn left at the oak tree and then you're gonna see a big red barn. And after the red barn, you're gonna go around the barn, but then over to the, if it's more complex, she's going to go up that central line again and head in the opposite direction. And this creates a figure eight. It's the figure eight dance. The alumnus get the sign for infinity. And each time she comes to that central line, each time she plants herself to make that shaking, she's communicating something to her sisters who are following her. I think it was Jürgen Tautz who talks about it as looking like a little comet tail of bees, sisters following her in the dark, reading through their antenna other information. So they're finding out about scent. They're finding out about the pollen that's on her body. They're reading the movement of her body. And, oh no, it wasn't. It was Seeley, Tom Seeley, who talked about the comet trail. Uh, in his book, Honeybee Democracy, where he, he talks a lot about this dance because it's also used in how they communicate um, where a new home is when they swarm, which is a different topic. So in a way, what she's doing is she's doing a reenactment of her journey to get to that flower. The other thing that's happening is that while she's vibrating, she's also um, buzzing her wings. And this is causing even more vibration within the hive. Remember that this is all happening within the dark. So it's creating this vibration that's radiating out through the comb. And even if you're a sister bee a couple combs away, you're still feeling the impact of that vibration so ever so subtly. And that's communicating that there is abundance nearby. There's abundance. So even if you're not witnessing the dance, you're being impacted by it. The duration of the waggle part is, quote, <laughs> again from Tom Seeley, directly proportional to the length of the outward journey. 
Okay, so what does that mean? Um, directly proportional to the length of the hour journey. I think that's the quote that's from Jurgen Tauts. Sorry about that. <laughs> he has a great book called The Buzz About Bees, not Buzz by Thor Hansen. Okay, so again, if it's more and longer of a route that they're taking, if they if they just go a couple, it's nearby. If they go a little further and it's a little bit more involved, that waggle just means that it's further afield. They have to go farther away. This amount of the amount of waggles and how intense it is is also communicating uh, the the complexity of the landscape. So if it's an open field, they don't have to communicate as much. But if there's like a mountain and a barn and a and some forest and a river, they might have to communicate more. And so there's there are more vibrations or more waggles going through. One second of the waggle communicates about a thousand meters of flight. One second communicates about a thousand meters of flight. So when you see a bee doing it for a while, three or four seconds further afield, you can actually observe this in the hive when you're beekeeping and you can start to know, oh, okay, there's something nearby. Oh, there's something far away. And it's like, it's a ways that she's really doing that for a while. And lastly, maybe lastly, the angle of the vibration in relationship to the straight up and down. So the top of the comb, the top sky, the sun, straight up and down. Um, the angle that she is facing on the comb in relationship to the horizontal line of the comb tells the bees the direction they need to fly in relationship to the sun to find the food. Tells them whether they need to fly at 38 degrees, whether they need to fly at 90 degrees. If they're learning about it, um, you know, they, they, they learn to memorize time. So how to communicate it at different, when and where to go at different times of day. They're doing bee math. It's very cool. And once these bees start to sort of mirror and mimic the sister bee, which you can't really see with the naked eye, it's only been observed with um, you know, like high tech cameras and slowing things down and all that stuff. But these sister bees are starting to mirror it. Once they, they really got it, off they go looking for the food themselves. So there you go. So if you see a bee doing this little slow dance and then one circle and little slower dance in one circle, um, or maybe she's really excited and it's fast. It's a very complex language. Um, that's going to be 50 to 70 meters away. And if you see a longer figure eight dance, it's going to be more than that. And then beyond all of this, the places where the bees dance are also marked on the comb. They have dance floors. They have chemically scented locations, usually near the entrance that are the preferred locations for the bees to come back and do the dance. So for instance, as a beekeeper, if you go in and you take out a comb and you move it to a different part of the hive, you do some rearranging, the bees are going to go and search for that dance floor, even if it's no longer at the entrance, which is way more convenient, even if they have to travel to the back of the hive because you moved it there, they're gonna go find that dance floor. So, there's so much hidden magic going on in how they communicate about these flowers. Okay. I think we're gonna open up to questions in a moment. I just wanna touch on maybe one more thing. I'm just looking at my notes and seeing if it's if it's necessary. You know, I think maybe I'll I'll um I'll end with two little two little things. One is sort of an anecdotal piece of information, and that's that I remember we were talking about light and the ultraviolet spectrum of light. To bees, that's going to appear often sort of a, a radiant bluish color. And it's said that bees prefer blue and purple and white flowers. 
but bees see blue differently than we do. Blue is actually pretty rare in nature. You know, we, we as humans have sought it, that in purple for, for a long time. We've, um, you know, huge amounts of trade industry has, has grown around, for instance, indigo blue dye coming out of India or Peru because it's so sought after. In fact, the blues that we have today are mostly synthetic blues. Um, blue is not commonly found. It takes a plant a lot of energy to produce blue. Of course, we see it in water and whatnot, and we are naturally drawn to blue as humans because probably, you know, a blue sky, good weather, healthy air, probably, hopefully, blue water, healthy water, you know, these are life sustaining things. We're very drawn to blue. And so are the bees. But blue is not commonly produced by flowers. Um, and so there's a theory that because it's hard for plants to produce blue, the ones that do might have evolved in order to, to attract bees and pollinators. As an example, um, the, in, in the Himalayan mountains, that's a place where there are blue flowers. Um, and this is possibly because you know, we know there's blue flowers, we, we have them in our gardens, but they're just not as common. And this is possibly because this is a harsher area to grow, to, to survive in. And so the plants really need to have something that's going to wow the bees. There's not gonna be as many bees. They really need to get those bees to them. And so they're going to do what they can to like add more inducement to bringing those bees in, something that's really going to attract them, which is the color blue. And that is in part because bees see more blue than we do, than we see. The, the ultraviolet spectrum of light appears blue to them, as I said. And so they're gonna see a lot more blue flowers. We're gonna see a white flower, we're going to see a purple flower, but to the bees, those are gonna be various, variating sh various shades of blue. And they're going to have blue sort of elect, uh, reflective surfaces as well with the ultraviolet light. And so that's part of why um, when you look at pollinator plants, you, you really see a lot of the big ones that are huge nectar producers that are very popular for the bees being blue flowers, like Russian sage, uh, forage, huge one, lupin, um, baby blue eyes, that kind of thing. So that's one little anecdote that I love. And I think we'll end with a quote from Jacqueline Freeman. She has such a beautiful book, um, The Song of Increase. And then that she's talking about, there's a section where she talks about the mineral, mi mineral migration of plants. And she talks about, for instance, dandelions and how dandelions, you know, they have a role and they are able, they have these big deep tap roots that go far into the soil and they draw up minerals from deep in the soil. These minerals are things like iron and calcium. And when these, dandelions are allowed to live their lives. And we're always told to mow out, get, get rid of the dandelions, mow the lawn, but when they're allowed to live their lives and then actually decompose, they decompose back into the soil and change the mineral composition of the soil. So this is coming from Jacqueline Freeman's book. Um, if left alone, they'll take over a yard for a while, a number of years and reconstitute the soil. And then they will move on to another area that need, needs support. And part of how they find out where they need to go, where they need to move for that support system, for that, that soil, is what's being communicated to them from the bees bringing in pollen from other regions. So the bees are also communicating back to the flowers where the flowers need to migrate which is just amazing to me. Again, I just get so excited about this. So here's this um, quote. 
As bees gather nectar and pollen, they deeply sense the history of the land. They understand the intent through the pollen and nectar to expand the movement of plants to their rightful places. Such a beautiful relationship, this love affair between bees and flowers. So I will end there. Hopefully you learned some fascinating little tidbits about bees and also just have a deeper appreciation, appreciation for the love affair that exists that is both practical and nourishing and something else entirely where a flower gets to bloom and open itself to the sunlight, to the world and gets visited, tickled by a bee and that this is a relationship sought after by both beings, even though they aren't even in the same category. One is the fl flora, one is the fauna. They aren't the same species. Where do you see that? Where do you see that happen? You know, you don't. That's so unique, this relationship between pollinators who are animals and plant life and how they come together to support the nourishment, well-being, and reproduction of, well, flowers and the nourishment of the bees. So there you go. All right, I'll open up to some questions. I'll, ch I'll check the chat and you can also use the uh, raise your hand icon for those of you showing up live. One second. Yeah, um, someone was commenting on when you're beekeeping, you know, there's a general rule of thumb that um, natural beekeepers try to focus on as one of the principles, which is to, to keep the hive in the order that you found it. So when you're moving combs around, you're not wanting, unless there's a really good reason, you're not, you're not invert, inadvertently just putting them somewhere else. In fact, you're making sure that they go back in in the same direction you pull them out. So if you pulled it out with one face facing the entrance and this is facing back, you don't want to flip it around and put it back. The bees have organized and designed their home in the way that they want. And it's very specific. Yeah. Great. Any questions? Mm, I'm so glad this has been fun for you too. They are incredible creatures. If I were to give you any homework, it would be go find poetry. There's a lot of it out there about the bee and the flower. Pablo Neruda has a ton. There's bees all over his like book on love sonnets, if you want a place to go look. Raquel. Hello, Bella. Um, I'm interested to know, for those of us who don't keep bees and want to sort of have more of this communion style thing with flowers. Mm -hmm. I know there's flower essences. I know you can drink floral waters. I'm just wondering if you have any other suggestions. Like I've had the experience where I've almost felt ecstatic by smelling flowers, oh. right? So I, I'm just interested on your thoughts of how we can deepen that relationship if we're not directly working with bees. Oh yeah, I think that we don't have to be directly working with any organism <clears throat> or land feature to have a, a deep and powerful relationship with them. Um, you know, what's the, who's the author? Cohen, I can't remember his first name. Cohen is the last name, C-O-W-A-N, uh, Plant Spirit Medicine, I think is his book. I'm trying to see if I can recognize it over there in my book. Oh my God, I can. Elliot Cohen. <laughs> um, Plant Spirit Medicine. Yeah, that's an interesting book to take a look at. <clears throat> but what comes to mind is a few things. If we're to take something from this lecture, specifically from honeybees themselves, it would be um, they are very loyal to one flower at a time. They learn everything they can from that one flower. They bathe in it, they drink the nectar, they experience the pollen. So what would it be like to have a dedicated practice for a contained amount of time, like a week or a month, 
where you were really steeping yourself in that flower, everything from, again, drinking flower water, to smelling the flowers, to just sitting and observing the flowers, to working with the parts that if they can be a tea, working with them as a tea, internally flower essences, um, or, you know, <laughs> write to them, talk to them, act like they can hear you. It's the same with the bees. There's there's a lot that can come from just setting aside all the programming for a second and acting as if you talking, singing, writing, composing poetry, reading it out loud to the, to the flowers, <clears throat> inviting them into your dreams can and does evoke a response, that they do hear you, <clears throat> that they can hear you. And so, you know, be like the bee and, and dedicate yourself for a period of time to one flower and see what you learn. <laughs> Slow Botanical says, that's exactly how I started my relationship with flowers. So powerful, yeah, yeah. And, you know, uh, intuitive plant medicine is a really great course taught by Asia Suler <clears throat> that it helps you do this. It's like, what I do with bees, about communicating with bees, I see these very similar things with flowers with her. So she would be another resource. Also, um, the School of the Sacred Wild. And of course, anybody here who teaches, I don't know who you all are, but if you teach, uh, that those are some great ways of listening. Um, Ronnie, my husband and I recently built our home. I want to keep bees. I want to do it in a good way. I have been on the fence of whether to start beekeeping this year to focus on planting native flowers and further developing gardens. Any thoughts and suggestions? One, always plant. Always plant. Uh, the more the better. Closer, the better. But bees thrive the closer there is organic forage that isn't sprayed with pesticides. <laughs> Two. What if you walked out on your land where you might want to keep bees, where you might want to plant, and sat down, leaned against a tree, laid down on the land, and just asked, is this the time for bees? Maybe do it every day for a few days. Is this the time for bees? And see what happens in your body. See what happens in your imagination. See if anything comes to you sort of out of the blue. Just notice. You might get an answer through your body in a way that trying to decide and think about it um, throws us off, you know? There's a lot of wonderful, wonderful tools with our intellect and information we can gather, but sometimes it's about going to the body of the earth and the body of the land with your own body and listening. Do I feel like excited? Do I feel kind of overwhelmed when I ask that question? Do I feel a, some kind of yes? Do I feel a mm, not quite? I just notice, what does the land need in order to keep bees? That's another good question. I'm just be curious to what shows up. I'm gonna go back. Um, okay, okay. Any other questions? Oh, great, Sophia Rose, thank you. Everybody, there's a, oh, I know, I didn't realize it was you. I know you, you're someone else who I love to learn from. Sorry about that. Yes, um, good to see you. Um, yeah, uh, really great link. Thank you for that sharing that. If you don't see it, everybody, it's um, a, a book about listening to plants. Um, you're someone else I would highly recommend in the, the community of plant sisters I know. Um, building up the health of the soil. Yeah. You know, I think it's sort of one of the missing elements. And I, I just highly recommend reading that section from the Song of Increase. I'll write it down here, everybody. If you don't know it, um, Jacqueline Freeman's work is really beautiful. So Song of Increase. And she talks about... <laughs> Minerals and soil migration, mineral migration and soil, and amending the soil, taking care of the soil. Yeah. Anybody else have any questions in the last five minutes?
right? Okay. Well, with that being said, I always love to name a few resources. So some of the resources I lean into for this work and for this lecture, I'm not gonna write them down. I'll just tell you in case you're interested. I'm looking at some of them now. So The Buzz About Bees by Jürgen Tautz. There's the last name, T-A-U-T-Z. Uh, has a really great section called What the Flower Knows. Um, I think it's called What the Flower Knows about bees or something like that. It's a, it's a part of the book. It's a great section on flowers. I get a lot from there. Uh, I always recommend The Sacred Bee by Hilda Ransom. Spelled. And that has a lot of lore in there. Uh, you just have to kind of, it's like a needle in a haystack. You're gonna find little bits about flowers and nectar and whatnot. Um, there's a fascinating read that touches on mead and wine and such called uh, The Wild and Cultivated Wine and Euripides. If you're into some of the Greek lore, that might be an interesting spot for you. Um, and here's the name of the article. And it's by Carl A. P. Brock. Um, Planting for Pollinators is another favorite book. Like what's else? Um, and the Song of Increase. And then, um, yeah, those are some of the big ones that I was looking at as, as I was getting ready for this course. Oh, and Tom Seeley, I mentioned that. His research is fantastic. The book I mentioned was Honey Bee Democracy. Um, and another favorite resource for sort of poetic inspiration in relationship to the flowers is Sylvia Lindstedt and uh, particularly her, um, her substack, The Pollen Basket. Although she did just come out with a wonderful book called The Venus Year. Um, poetry wise, I was reading Khalil Gutebran. I also recommend um, Pablo Neruda. And let's see, are any other ones come to mind? There's just so many. Get out of go look for them yourself. Safo. Yeah. Okay. There's some resources for you. Have some fun and be curious about what's happening in this little love affair that's all around us all the time between the bees and the flowers. Thanks for attending. And if you're interested in future lectures, the next one is in a month. I'll be teaching it from England while I'm traveling with my little toddler. And it's about animism and beekeeping. And you can find out all of that on my website. I'll also send a follow-up with a recording. And uh, the lectures are 20 apiece, or you can do the whole series for 70. So there you go. Okay. Take care, everybody. Blessed be. Enjoy the spring. Lots of love. Au revoir.